Hi, Misha here. And sometimes it's just the simple things in life that are really exciting. I have a lot of pretty nice diecast models, and I also have some pretty nice firearms. In fact, last year a nice one came in, and in the same week I picked up a couple of these Yugoslavian-made Zastava M88s, a very cheap little pistol. You could buy these for as little as $150 brand new, 200 bucks. even now they're $300. But I always wanted a Yugoslavian military one because they're pretty uncommon with the wood grips. And to be honest, that week when I had a several thousand dollar gun come in and I had this couple hundred dollar gun come in, this brought me just as much satisfaction <laughs> as the more expensive gun. And this extends to models as well. This week had a, another De Agostini 172 scale diecast come in of another Japanese plane. And these are relatively inexpensive little models. 20, sometimes 25 bucks. And as much as I like hobby masters and corgis and caliber wings and all that stuff, sometimes it's the simple ch cheap ones that are just as delightful because corgi, hobby master are never going to do this aircraft. This is the Japanese, this is the Navy version, by the way, Mitsubishi J8M1, known as the Shusui which is uh, basically what was intended to be a licensed copy of the German Messerschmitt ME-163 Comet. Although, life didn't quite work out that way. Here's a little Amerkum one. And here is a Oxford of the Comet. But this video is not going to be on these, although I probably should cover the Comet soon. Now, I just want to talk about this little inexpensive model and however Tom Diggs and he brings a couple of these weird aircraft in, it just makes me happy because this aircraft technically did go into production, although never saw military combat. They would build 67. However, 60 were test gliders and training gliders. Only seven were actually powered. And just like with the Comet, this is a rocket-powered interceptor using extremely dangerous, corrosive, volatile two-mixture fuel. S-Stoff and T-Stoff in Germany. The Japanese had their equivalent. And it's also remarkable because this is one of the few times the Japanese Army Air Force and Japanese Navy Air Force cooperated, or nearly so, as, as much as they were ever going to cooperate. Of course, the ending of the war had a lot to do with that. So yeah, we'll just dive into this a bit and talk about the history. Beginning with the Comet here, one kind of interesting thing, this one has the, the wheels on it, the kind of dolly landing gear system, and a little pilot in it, but it's a lighter weight metal from Americum. The uh, Oxford isn't as polished, I guess you would say. It... Uh, doesn't have a pilot, doesn't have gear in the down position. This uh, tail unit does retract and extend slightly, not on the model, but on the real plane. Notice it doesn't have the wheels, but it's very heavy metal. Not bad for 20 bucks. But yeah, the Comet, rocket powered glider, essentially. And, uh, this was something the Japanese were quickly interested in. By 1942-43, the war starting to really turn in the Pacific. They knew if they didn't get America to sit down for peace by the end of 41, excuse me, 42, it wasn't going to go well. And that was exactly what happened. And then, of course, the B-29 was known. It wasn't in service yet, but they knew it was coming. And at first, the U.S. actually threatened Germany with it. They needed an interceptor, both Japan and Germany. And Germany started t 
testing out the 163 and a Japanese delegation, military attaches, saw this being tested and were very interested. So in the end of 1943, a deal was struck. Japan would produce under license the Comet at home. And they would pay 20 million Reichsmarks for the Walter 509A engine alone. And a little less for the glider airframe because it was a little more intuitive. The main thing about this aircraft was the engine. And yeah, the, the terms were that Germany would deliver one complete ME-163 to Japan as a pattern aircraft. They would also deliver at least two complete subsets for assemblies and whatnot. Of course, drawings and blueprints besides. They would deliver three Walter engines. They would allow the Japanese to observe German manufacturing techniques and take notes. They would also inform the Japanese of any updates to the design while things are going on. Very smart of them. And they would let the Japanese observe Luftwaffe tactics. So they would know how to deploy their, their version. And this was all to be done. They were going to start delivering by the spring of 1944. And uh, Japan paid. And Germany, well, they started to fulfill their end of the bargain. They loaded things up onto submarines. We had a Japanese submarine would come in in March of 44 and load up a disassembled aircraft, as well as blueprints, plans, what have you. That would be that would leave Germany for Japan on the 30th of that month. And another submarine, I-29, would carry other technical specs, engines, that kind of components, more things, and it would leave occupied France about two weeks later in April of 1944. So, yeah, a disassembled Messerschmitt plus engines, documentation, manuals, and some of the Japanese delegation that had been kind of witnessing how things were progressing in Germany were on the way by early spring of 44, just as promised and intended. So things are going quite well at this point. Well, the first sub with the plane was spotted and sunk by an escort carrier hunter killer group in the Atlantic in May of 44. The second sub, a little more successful. It actually made it all the way to Singapore, docked there, and then went on to the Philippines. But unfortunately, when it was actually quite close to Japan, it was tracked and torpedoed by an allied submarine. Glug. So that didn't make it. Now Germany would try again in early 45, loading more stuff onto a U-boat. But again, it would quickly be sunk. And you'd think this would sink the project. But oh no, no, no. The Japanese really wanted this. The B-29 threat was only getting more and more imminent in 1944, with some early raids even. Both the Army and the Navy really wanted this. Now, they did disagree, because of course they did. The Navy thought, hey, let's just copy the Comet. It's a tested design. The glider works. The engine works. The Army liked the idea of copying the Walter engine, but wanted to make a new airframe, new design. Well, in the end, the Navy's idea, which was probably the right one, yeah, that won out. And in July of 1944, a specification for the new rocket-powered interceptor was issued by the government. And quickly, Mitsubishi would be given the task, the contract, and they would come up with a mock-up, a concept model, in September, which would lead to a prototype being ordered. But how did they do this? They didn't really have anything from Germany. Well, when... The submarine docked in Singapore, luckily for Japan, a few officers got off and would board a plane to fly home early, and they would take with them 
it's from technical manuals, flight manuals, paperwork, and just first-hand experience of looking at the 263 in Germany. This was all Japan really had to go off of. Luckily, kind of knowing which way to go, it's a glider. I mean, the, the airframe is not anything particular once you know the dimensions and structure and all that. The engine, more so, but they knew that the, the fuel, the T-stuff, the C-stuff used that mixture. They knew what was going on. So, yeah, they were able to actually closely copy the aircraft. Now, the first prototype would be a glider just to test the structure. Known as the MXY-8. Its Japanese name would actually be Autumn Grass. Kind of important for later. And it actually did really well. They lifted it uh, aloft. They put a man in. He piloted it down. And it performed very much like the 263. And uh, was a very successful glider. This would lead to two or three more glider prototypes being ordered. One of which was sent to the Army for their testing. The Navy, on the other hand, ordered a more advanced prototype known as the KU or Ku-13. And eventually a Ki-13 prototype would be sent to the Army as well. And they would start building more unpowered versions to be used as training models. So yeah, in January of 1945, things are progressing looking uh, pretty good. So even though there's not a lot of specs to talk about, let's compare the uh, Japanese and the Comet. So these are in scale together. What Japan came up with was a very close copy, but it was ever so slightly larger. The German version had a wingspan of a little over 30 feet, the Japanese about 31. Likewise, front to back, the German was about 18 and a half feet. The Japanese, depending on which variant, was between 19 and 20 feet, so just slightly longer. But on the other hand, the Japanese version was lighter, about uh, eight, 900 pounds lighter. That's because they used more wood. The main spar was wood, the tail was wood, other components. They also did not do armored glass. The German version, this cockpit is uh, bulletproof. And the Japanese, they thought, eh, we don't need a bulletproof cockpit. So, they did away with that. It still used the uh, undercarriage, the little ejectable dolly system. And the German version had two 30mm cannon with 60 rounds each. The Japanese version had two 30mm cannon as well, but 53 rounds each. Now, there would be two versions made, the J8M1 for the Navy that used the HO-105, HO-105 naval cannon, which was, you know, good out of cannon. And the Army would fit theirs with the slightly heavier Type 5 cannon, still 30 millimeter. Now these were, even though they were had fewer shells, one of the things about the German 30 millimeter cannon, it kind of shot like a rainbow. It relatively low velocity. The Japanese cannon, while lighter, they actually had a, a flatter trajectory, higher muzzle velocity. So there's that. On the other hand, the uh, German aircraft held more fuel. This could have seven and a half minutes of powered flight <laughs> not much but the original J8 M1 had enough for five and a half minutes of powered flight it had less fuel on board and the rocket engine was a little less efficient as well both had pretty similar climb rates and everything about 430 to 435 miles per hour and they had a maximum speed for diving, gliding of about 550 miles per hour. But, uh, yeah, limited power flight. And because of the lighter guns, less fuel, less 
ammunition lighter aircraft the Japanese copy of the Valter engine known as the RO2 RO2 just was not as efficient so in the end it still performed a little less effectively than the German but never mind because they actually copied this pretty much using nothing so not bad at all so both the Army and Navy ordered them into production. Again, the Army version was the Ki-200. And uh, Mitsubishi had mostly worked on the glider frame itself. And the Yokozuku uh, Naval Yard really developed the engine or re reworked the Volter engine for Japanese tech. So we have these companies. Yokozuka made a lot of the gliders. There were also two other companies making gliders that's why they made as many as 60 Mitsubishi was focusing on producing the full fighter now they the uh, the KU-13 was still not powered but it did use ballast to simulate engines and weapons kind of full weight and they're getting ready for full mass production so let's take the Dagestini off the stand it's actually very heavy all metal in the tail has the two cannon which are the most distinguishing feature from the German version and it does come with either this piece here without the wheels or you can install a piece that has the wheel and one thing I was curious to see if they would do the rear here if they would go to the trouble of providing both wheel up and down and they did so that's really neat so after the successful flight of the prototype with ballast in January, this was ordered into production as the J8M1 Shu Sui, which uh, means autumn water. Again, the glider was autumn grass, but it's actually more than that. It actually means the swishing of a sword, which makes sense for this aircraft. It's, it's a, I mean, Komet's a pretty cool name. Uh, I don't know. This is, this is even cooler. And it's quite understandable why the Japanese would uh, would want this. So they started uh, assigning a squadron to train up using the gliders in February and March. And then in June, uh, rocket engines were attached, their RO2, to the first gliders. And they did a, a few final glide tests with the engine on board, but not active. And then they were ready for the first powered flight. Now the plan was, and this honestly, the Comet wasn't as well suited to the Luftwaffe as the J8M or Ki-200 would be to the Japanese because this is a short-powered interceptor. The idea was to fly up, intercept a B-29, use the cannon, exhaust the 106 total 30 millimeter shells on one or two aircraft, swoop back down, and then, you guessed it, basically do a, a ramming attack, a dive attack, a kamikaze, although the army didn't call them kamikaze. They called them special attack groups. So they, they were going to form these. And this is, yeah, because of the speed and short duration and kind of weird landing anyway, a, a better suited aircraft than a lot. And they were a lot cheaper to produce than a full-fledged aircraft because, yeah, what are you really sacrificing? A mostly wood glider frame and a rocket engine with just highly combustible and corrosive stuff in there so if it hit a plane it could probably start a big fire or just do do nasty stuff notice it doesn't have the little electric turbine on the front like the german Had a little difference it doesn't have the antenna on top either yeah slightly different so they're ready to go in july of 1945 to have the first powered flight and the idea was okay we're going to ramp up for production mitsubishi fuji and nissan were actually all tooling up for mass production and you know getting the assembly lines ready to go and we're going to put this in service by the end of august 1945 and they planned to build a lot of these in 1946 so they had big plans but first one of them needs to take off and actually get in the sky on an, under its own power on july 7th 1945, the first J-8 M1 took off, and it 
climbed quite well. Got up to about 1,300 feet, and the engine cut off. Now, the aircraft would stall, but since it is a glider, this wasn't as detrimental as on some other aircraft. So no big deal. The pilot, being experienced, took it around and actually was gliding it in quite well to the airfield when his, he was coming in low, these big old wings, one of the edges clipped a small structure, flipping the plane. And it, when it hit the ground, that extremely corrosive, destructive fuel ignited and burst into flames. And remember, made of mostly wood, or at least partially wood. So burned real good. And the story of the pilot, I don't care if the Japanese were enemies or not, what happened to him was uh, nothing I would wish on anyone. Unfortunately, he survived. And I say that because he was severely burned. And by survived, I meant about a day. He eventually did succumb to his burn wounds the next day, but I can't even imagine the agonizing pain he was in. That's, um, it would have been better if he'd just been killed outright. So credit where credit's due. And also credit where credit's due, even though the Japanese were fighting an extremely desperate war and were perfectly happy to have kamikaze or special attack groups, they weren't ruthless towards their own people and that much. They actually ordered an immediate cessation of test flights until the problem could be tracked down and fixed. And both the Navy and Mitsubishi worked tirelessly to figure out what happened. Turns out the test aircraft was only partially fueled up so when it climbed, the fuel shifted, which caused an airlock in the engine, which caused a shutoff to kick in, and that's why the engine cut out. So it would have been fine if he hadn't clipped that building, though. Just a succession of unfortunate events. The solution was to rework the fuel pump in the RO2 engine. And the government was insistent that they could only resume test flights once the updated engine was ready to go. And it was installed in the 6th and 7th production models. Now that's the J8M1. By the summer of 45, they were also working on a long-range version, long-range in quotes, known as the J8M2. It would delete one of the cannon, replacing it with more fuel. This would up the flight time to endurance to seven minutes. So still 30 seconds shy of what the Comet had for powered flight, but a minute and a half more than the M1. But the J8 M2, while finalized in August of 1945, never went into production. So even though they only made seven complete production level aircraft, many sub-assemblies and parts were already being produced by Mitsubishi, Fuji, Nissan. And there were big plans, but of course the war would end on August 15th and immediately the project would be suspended. But it was an interesting project. So in November of that, of that year, the U.S. would cart off three of the rocket-powered little interceptors back home for a study. And one of them would be immediately scrapped after study. Another would be displayed for a couple of years and then scrapped. And the third, after study, was actually put on display and is still existing in a museum in America today. But that's not the only one in the world. Interestingly, in 1961, a fuselage of a J-8 M1 was discovered in a cave in Japan. Probably it was uh, put there by some workers from the factory who had been working on the fuselage. It was never a completed aircraft. Anyway, it was uh, put in a cave for 15 years in you know, wood and caves. It was pretty deteriorated. But a couple of years later, it was presented to the JSDF, the Japanese Air Self-Defense Force, who used it as kind of a display piece, an interesting chunk of history throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Finally, in 1997, Mitsubishi, still an existing company, took the incomplete fuselage 
and decided to refurbish it. And this took about five years. They were done around 2002, 2003. But when they were done, it was a complete J8 M1, which still exists in the uh, Mitsubishi Museum today. So there is one existing aircraft in Japan and one in America, which is, you know, more than exists of a lot of late war prototype type aircraft. So that's pretty cool, I think. Well, I appreciate you hanging out with me for a bit. I wanted to give a, a history and a tribute to this aircraft because Japan really pulled out all the stops to make this happen. And yeah, there's plenty of little 172 scale diecast models of the Comet, although they tend to be from your cheaper brands, Oxford, Atlas, Americum. But because the Agostini focuses on Japanese aircraft, and armor for that matter, they're probably the only ones that are ever going to do this. And they're not a bad little brand. They're based on the old IXO tooling. And uh, I'm very happy to have this. It's um, definitely worth 20 bucks to me. comes with a perfectly decent stand. And they've done a lot of weird late war aircraft. So I've done some videos on them, like the J7W and the uh, A7M and so on and so forth. But uh, yeah, there's just nothing really out there on YouTube about this aircraft, either the model or the history. So I wanted to give a little thing here and just switch gears and talk about Japanese planes again. So let me know what you think. I would not want to be anywhere near the fuel for these aircraft. It was horrific. That said, damn, a rocket-powered plane. Um, yeah, certainly, certainly interesting. <laughs> if you could, please like, share, and subscribe, all that good stuff. This is Misha. And I'll catch you very soon next time.